Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash to pieces of genre cinema. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And today we are kicking off the month of December in style with a very 90s Christmas treesome. Notice that the person who chose these films is a lot happier than the person who had to sit through them. You see what we did there though, treesome. That was you. Yes, that was that, that was, was you should be proud that of. That I am proud of. And uh I will say congratulations on the first two films of this episode. Well, yeah. <laughs> you've interrupted my speech. Oh, sorry, okay. carry on, carry on. Uh, today we're kicking off okay. the month of December in style with a very nineties Christmas tree sum. Yes, that's three festive treats for the price of one. Now these three films have a lot in common. They're festive, they're animated. They're from the 1990s, they're thankfully not feature length, and all three are absolute shite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Summed it up pretty well there. Thank you. Um, two of them also want to be Toy Story, oddly yes, enough. Yes, of course. Um, which for one of them, that's... One of them came out before Toy Story, and I'm sure if it was after, it would still want to be Toy Story. I don't know what this one wants to be, but let's... <laughs> um... Let's not waste any time getting yeah, into this, because the first you know. one is the one I'm most excited to talk about, so... First up is... The Christmas Tree, from 1991. Directed by Fl Flamarian Ferreira, who... Ver that's a fantastic name, Flamarian Ferreira. I know, congratulations you, uh, but not for making this film. No. Worked on the animation department for Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, Casper and the Angels, The World's Greatest Super Friends, The Flintstones, The Fonz and the Happy Days Gang. I, I had no idea there was a Happy Days animated series. Smurfs. Oh, every, everything had a fucking animated series. Pac-Man. There we go. He-Man, Fantastic Four, Phineas and Ferb, and so much more. So... Great CV. Yeah. Um, some, you know, well-known animated classics there. Uh, and went on to make this. Yeah, with its 1.4 on IMDb. Yeah. Written by Nels Christensen, who didn't do anything else at all. Unknown of budget. Course. And straight to video. Well, it wasn't. It was no? shown once. It was on, on the TV. USA yeah. Network. It was shown once, and then simultaneously released on VHS yeah. to absolutely no acclaim whatsoever. So tell tell our listeners um, your process for picking these films, because I would love to know. Um, essentially what I did <laughs> was I went on to Letterboxd, and there's a fantastic list on Letterboxd, um, which is a never-ending Christmas list. I went on there, I, you know, filtered it, from lowest rated to highest rated, and I looked through them, and I was like, yep, that sounds good, that sounds good, that sounds good. Was this number one <laughs> on the lowest rated? Uh, no, that was, um, oh, what was the one we did last year? Oh, Saving Christmas. Saving okay, Christmas. fair enough, fair Saving enough. Saving Christmas was the lowest All rated three of these Christmas are a film. fucking, a masterpiece as compared to Saving Christmas. Yes. Um, I, f I find... I find some of the worst films I've seen are Christmas films. Yeah, yeah, of course. And also some of the worst films I've seen are animated films. Some of the worst songs I've heard are oh, Christmas God. songs. <laughs> so, you know, I'm uh, a, a jolly guy when it comes to Christmas every year, aren't we all? You know, everyone loves a bit of Christmas. But fuck me, there's a lot of trash that comes with it. Mm. This, I can't get my head around, this, this film. 1991, okay? What was released around this time where we have had... The Little Mermaid by this point. Um, oh, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Beauty and the Beast was the year later. A year later. Okay. Um, what 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 was big around this time? I can't, cannot get my head around what this film is trying to be and who the fuck it's made for. I mean, Silence of the Lambs was <laughs> the same year, so that might be the connection. <laughs> I mean, animated wise, I don't know what it's trying to be. It's just, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, it, we don't know anyone it actually, in it. Actually, so... it kind of felt like it was trying to be Matilda. So the book of Matilda yeah. had, was out, you know, for many years before, and it was trying to be Matilda and also kind of like Annie, I suppose. I su 
suppose, yeah. With the orphanage and it was kind of weird. Like, Care Bears was big then because <laughs> I found the animated animation kind of looked a little Care Bear-ish. Okay. That is an insult to the Care Bears. This yeah. animation is horrifying. Well, this it, is it, well there's one particular terrifying. thing. One particular thing that stands out. The children's eyes. The children's eyes. Seriously. Terrifying. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know anyone in this, so let's, no. let's skip that and get no. to our uh, first feature presentation. The following is a USA Network's kids special presentation. That tree is still going to cause me a lot of trouble. I don't want the children playing outside anymore. You better make sure of that. Because you don't want the mayor to see them without new clothes. Lily, Pappy, and Licorice went to the North Pole. Lily! 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 Uh, we're greeted with opening credits with a generic sound and soundtrack. Uh, and when, you know, discussing films like this where there's no Wikipedia as a guidelines to go by, you have to write these little things down because you think, you know, what if it doesn't get any more exciting? Oh my God, it quickly gets more exciting when we hear, yes, yes, there are many stories about the holiday we call Christmas. Okay, narrator, if you don't want to be here, <laughs> fucking leave. <laughs> you don't want to be here. Fuck it out. <laughs> he really sounds like he's a struggle to be there. He flicks through a book. Uh, he makes it move of his mind and finds today's story that takes place at an orphanage with a pine tree and an evil old bitch called Mrs. Mavilda. Now that kind of sounds like uh, something you just mentioned. Mrs. Mavilda runs with Matilda. Matilda. Also, Cruella de Vil. Cruella de Vil in the name, yeah. maybe. Yeah. I feel like the whole thing is trying to be a take on, if, if we're going by classic Christmas stories, the closest this comes is... Scrooge, but I mean, Not... a very problematic version of Scrooge. <laughs> well, a Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol, yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah. Does, was... If that's what they're going for, they Mrs. fucking Hannigan. failed. Mrs. Hannigan. Mrs. Hannigan was always referred to as Mrs. Hannigan in Annie. Okay. So okay. I think it's just a little yeah. amalgamation of everything. So this is the story of Mrs. Mavilda. Now, Mrs. Mavilda has <laughs> too much eyeshadow on, but admittedly has some fucking fierce purple lips. She going does. On the go. She does. It's a little um, it, very ahead of its time. Yeah, it's very way in now. Very J Lo. Um, yeah, J Lo. I know. It's, I suppose it's white, isn't it? Lipstick. Purple. Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. Yeah. By way of Glenn Close. Yeah. <laughs> um. The, the little ones are always forced to do all the heavy work by the wicked woman. At this evil orphanage. <laughs> uh, evil run orphanage. In a bizarre series of events. The kids are so fucking depressed. Okay, I shit you not. I, I Again, we talk about a lot of weird stuff on this podcast. I promise you this is what happens. The kids are so depressed to the point they've been forced to make friends with the fucking pine tree, which they've named Mrs. Hopewell because they want to believe it's magical. They want the tree to adopt them and take them away. <laughs> yeah. Fuck me. We also learn about how um, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Old bitch, I can't remember her name. Mavilda. Mavilda. Um, she pretends to the mayor that she's looking after the children. Um, just so she could steal the donations that she's give, that he's given to the orphanage. Uh, as soon as he leaves, she strips the kids out of their clothes. Very awkward. Um, yeah, so she has one pair of nice clothes that she puts on two of the kids each time the mayor visits. <laughs> and she's handed bags of money. And it's literally just a bag of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's just, there's no sort of denomination or anything. Just, here's a bag of money, thank you. The clothes, she immediately rips off them the moment he leaves. Yeah. Which is really awkwardly depicted in the film itself. Uh-huh. It's like, oh, what? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> why? Well, you know, we, we could have understood. You didn't have to show us, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> now, Mrs. Mavilda would use the money irresponsibly by having her nasty friends over and laughing and drinking and playing cards. <laughs> And whenever she puts a bag of money down for a bet, she goes, there goes the children's bread. <laughs> um, there's, the orphanage also has a dog, uh, poor licorice. 
Yeah. Now, he runs away at the beginning of the film, and the kids cheer him on, mm-hmm. but apparently he doesn't run away, because he's actually a, a fairly big well, part yeah. of the rest of the film. He, he just comes back. <laughs> and the rate, the rate, after all this, it's a Three, horrible... Three, four minutes of yeah. exposition about child labour, child abuse, abuse. Yeah. gambling people's money away. Exactly. It's awful, really yeah. sad. And now let's begin our story. <laughs> Oh god! Three minutes in. Where is it going from What here? story then? What fucking story are we gonna to listen to now? Well, the story is a young couple. I don't know. Judy and Ray move into town with with their two kids, and the mayor tells them that the wife, Judy, can move into the orphanage and help Mrs. Mavilda, while the husband goes off and does some sort of work that's never really explained. He's just out of the story, like the whole story. Yeah. Um, I think what's famous from this film, other than Mrs. Mavilda, is the delivery that Ray gives oh of God. his first line. Just him? Well, this is the famous okay. quote. We've come from the mares. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. This has the most lifeless voice acting I have ever heard in anything. It has, apart from Mrs. Mavilda. Oh, she's having the time of her life. That woman Mrs. hated Mrs. Mavilda is chewing the scenery. She is method she acting. She's hamming it up. <laughs> she is over the top. She's ridiculous, which just makes the rest of the delivery stand <laughs> out so much. Because it's like, we've come from the mayors. She's like, what? What do you want? Ah! <laughs> She does sound like one of the Boulay brothers. It's oh, fucking it's... ridiculous. Ray pisses off. He says, I'll be back before Christmas. <laughs> and I had a few questions. Why are their eyes so big? Why do they sound so bored? Why is Judy wearing a bonnet? But her religion isn't really mentioned. No. no. Um, I mean, if she was Amish, I could understand. You know. Yeah. And, and, but... She also drives a car later on, which she the does. Amish don't do yeah. as, as you know part of their culture. I feel like they're trying to make her look like an old maiden. Yeah, I don't. I don't really get the bonnet. Um, as expected, Mrs. Mavilda is a total bitch and makes the wife work and treats her kids, <laughs> the wife, uh, Judy's kids, like orphans. Judy's kids being Happy and Lily. No, Pappy. 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 Oh, I thought his name is fucking Pappy. Oh, I thought it was Happy. Yeah, I. Why the fuck oh. is his name Pappy? Well, I question why it was Happy, but <laughs> pa- Pappy and Lily. Pappy and Lily. Pappy and Lily. Now, I I feel like we need to state this at the beginning. This is a kid about... Uh, this is a film about the mistreatment of orphans. Yeah. Now, Pappy and Lily, the two kids who aren't orphans, are the only children in this film that get names. <clears throat> yeah. The none of the others have names. The orphans are just the orphans. So I have I can only describe them as the orphans or the kids. It's true. Um. So the kids tell Judy about Mrs. Hopewell, and some strange dialogue coming from them. One of them says, "When I'm scared, I imagine her branches holding me like arms." <laughs> to which the bookish girl, who's wearing glasses, of course, says, "I wish I could read to her from this book I found." Uh, <laughs> a book that will come in handy later. <laughs> so Judy and the kids wash licorice. And uh, you completely missed where. Um, I haven't completely missed. Judy, I, tro- I chose to miss. Ju- Judy goes to their new bedroom when she's being told uh, about the new surroundings. Like, well, I guess I'll just sleep on this old mattress on the floor. And Miss Mavilla is like, don't you think you'll be getting old luxuries here? It's a rusty old fucking mattress. She's probably going to catch something from that. And then... <laughs> and then Mrs. Mavilda's like, you'll work all day, you silly bitch. And then you'll spend half an hour with your kids after you've done your chores. And no more, no less. I'm like, oh my god, she's only allowed to spend half an hour with her own kids. Then you kids, you'll be treated like orphans. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Um... So, yeah, I don't know why Mrs. Mavilda is... This is... It's a big question throughout the whole film. Is why didn't Judy just go to the mayor earlier? <laughs> what what did make Judy, a grown-ass woman, put up with this? 
Okay. <laughs> so Judy and the kids wash licorice and build a swing and a slide for Mrs. Hopewell. Judy has completed all her chores and connected with the kids, much to Mrs. Mavilda's annoyance. They didn't think she'd connect her first, though, did they? When she first found licorice. And she was like, oh, if, if Mrs. Mavilda doesn't want, want him in here, we're going to have to get rid. And one of the kids, uh, one of the unnamed kids, is like, I knew we should uh, never have shown him to your mother. Yeah. And also, <laughs> always the same. Always ruin everything. But yeah, Judy finds a heart. The mayor's very pleased, isn't he? he is when he says, pleased. oh, they really are getting along. She appears to be a fine woman. <laughs> Um, the seasons change, and suddenly it's Christmas. This is a Christmas film. So I, I get a feeling that, that Ray's been away for a long time. Yeah. You know, the seasons change. It's whatever spring or whatever when they get there. So it's best part of a year, I feel. So the seasons change, suddenly it's Christmas, and the mayor has even more money than normal for the orphans. So they, they can get some Christmas presents and some new clothes. So instead of one bag of money... He now carries two bags of money. <laughs> An undisclosed sum, though. So the mayor asks Judy to organise the money as she's getting along so well with the orphans. But Mrs. Mavilda has other ideas mm. with the money. Uh, we get Judy teaching the orphans about Christmas. So the orphans didn't know about Christmas. Okay, they don't know who Santa was. Um, is there a song? No, um, no. Yeah, no, it's from Tommy. This, this... Tommy doesn't know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know who Jesus was or what praying is. This, this sequence is fucking deep. I mean, it starts with uh, Mrs. Mavilda calling up Frank. She's like, Frank, it's Mavilda. Do you feel lucky tonight? Good, because we're going to have a game. Don't forget the champagne. And then we get it into wine. We get Judy telling the kids all about Christmas and all the things that they've been deprived of their entire <laughs> life. Um... <laughs> we get it into rhyme with <laughs> Mrs. Mavilda and her pals having the best game of fucking cards ever. Yes. Yeah, they keep cutting to Mrs. Hopewell. Um, what confused me a little bit is, as Judy was teaching the orphans about Christmas, um, she mentions Mrs. Hopewell. Yeah. And it cuts to Mrs. Hopewell. And it's not snowing. <laughs> it's bright. And it's springtime. And then at the end of the scene, they go outside and it's snowing outside the building. <laughs> the next day, my favourite <laughs> scene from the film starts with, what a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same to, Kids won't know what a hangover is. This is what I mean. Who is this made for? Who is this made for? I mean... Helen absolutely fucking hands Mavilda's ass to her during the cards. Who's? Oh yeah, she but, does. That's she right, does. Mavilda. Now you're cooking with gas. <laughs> yeah, she does. So she's bet away all the money. Helen's a things. basic bitch, though. I I'd like to stand Helen more than I actually do, but she's a bit of a basic bitch. Mm -hmm. Like she wears a fucking peacock top, really shitty earrings. Just there's no effort been put into the animation for this character whatsoever. Well, they haven't been for any of them. They all wear the same fucking clothes. It's true. It's true. All but she time. wins all the money. Inside, outside, spring, summer, yeah. winter. Yeah. It's all the same. Mrs. Mavilda never changed, apart from when she's in bed. <laughs> which she is now with her hangover. She is. Mrs. Mavilda tells Judy that there is no money for the clothes <laughs> and the kids can't play outside. <laughs> um, confusingly, Mrs. Mavilda tells her that if she grasses her up to the mayor... Her and the kids will be out on the street. <laughs> but my confusion is, wouldn't the mayor get rid of Mrs. Mavilda? Yeah, render, she'd have no the, job. <laughs> rendering the threat pointless. Also, why is Judy just not like, hang on a minute, who the fuck who do, do you, you think, think you're talking you to? I'm you going to the mayor. If you're, I know that you're trying to hide all this from the mayor. <laughs> and because if the mayor found out, you'd get the sack. Mm. So why is you threatening to fire me? Despite my revelations to the mayor getting you the sack, why why am I putting up with this? And spoiler alert, that's exactly what happens at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So everything from this point forward is rendered pointless. It is completely pointless. It is. Mrs. Mavilda puts together an evil plan to make Judy look evil. Yeah. Like she did with the girl who worked with her before. <laughs> 
Fortunately for us, she says this all out loud whilst sitting up in bed, <laughs> looking like a bag of shit. <laughs> um, so he's trying to make she's trying to make Judy a good girl gone bad. Yes, just like Rihanna. Just like Rihanna. Mrs. Mavilda calls her pal Mel to set Judy up to be a thief, <laughs> giving the whole plan to him over the phone whilst one of the kids listens in. Including some amazing dialogue <laughs> where she says, she tells him about all the things he's got to put in a handbag. She's like, wow, that shouldn't be so difficult with your fast fingers, should it, Mel? Like, oh my God. She also explains her plan to cut down Mrs. Hopewell. Yes. Which Mel doesn't give two shits about, but it's important for the kids to hear. It is. And uh, when the the little girl, nameless orphan, (laughs) tells the other nameless orphans and uh, Pappy and Lily about Mrs. Mavilda's plan, um, she only really seems to care about cutting down Mrs. Hopewell. She didn't really care about Judy losing a job. Let's, yeah. This this is coming up now, isn't it? This 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 whole discussion that the kids have together. So yes. to, yeah, so she she tries telling um, Judy about it, but Judy just leaves. Uh, Mrs. Mavilda overhears and talking and calling her an evil witch and and so on. <laughs> Literally, I shit you not. Judy's kids, Pappy and Lily, they they really they genuinely say. We are not worried about our mother. She can defend herself. Mrs. Hopewell can't. Okay, kids. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's a little lesson for you. Mrs. Hopewell is a fucking tree. But Your mother is going to get sent to fucking prison. Yeah, but they think <laughs> she's a magical tree. Yeah, they're fucking idiots. I mean, seriously, they're going through a traumatic experience. I get it. They are. But at the same time, your mum's going to get sent to prison. Yeah. And you're going to be stuck... With that old bitch fucking in the being orphanage. horrible to you yeah. for the rest of your life. It's true. <laughs> but fortunately for them, she doesn't need to actually look after herself. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> some sort of magical no. entity saves yeah. the day. Do you know what the magical entity is? A nasty fucking car crash. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So after they explain that they don't worry about their mother because she, she can look after themselves... <laughs> The kids then plan to get to the mayor's office to warn him about what's about to happen. This goes on for so long. Oh, so long. And they choose Judy's son, Pappy, to do it. Because he remember he should remember where the mayor's office is because they went to the mayor first. Blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Pappy... <laughs> well, Licorice comes to the window <laughs> and Pappy, <laughs> in a very long dialogue... <laughs> very... <laughs> this did not need to happen. This did not at need all. to happen. He says, Licorice is at the window. He need only appears at the window if he's hungry. And he's always hungry at nine <laughs> o'clock. Which means the mayor will have left his office. And he won't be back until after Christmas. Why did it feel like this entire sequence they were writing it as it was oh being filmed? God. Like as as it was being made, they were writing it and they had to quickly add these so, things in. So much chat and shit in this film. <laughs> all the kids just talk, talk, talk. And then they wish upon a star, but not upon a star, as they wish to Santa. (laughs) But then decide that a wish isn't enough. (laughs) So they send Pappy to the North Pole, which appears to be fairly close by, according to the little nerdy girl's book. Um, So Pappy gets licorice to pull him on a sled (laughs) to the North Pole. Because the North Pole appears to be on the same land as them yeah Yeah. seems to be close by judy is saved when she's driving to mel's place and a police officer says we've had a terrible accident here she says but i must get past he says you're sorry you can't get past merry christmas (laughs) mom and she turns back and goes back so i don't know what divine intervention this was it's never explained but it's a car crash We've had a terrible crash. We see here. the cra- We see the the yeah. post crash car. Yeah. What kid is going to be like? Ah, oh, do you know what my favourite scene was in uh, in the Christmas tree? Oh, it was that fucking nasty car accident. Yeah. Like- but this, if this is divine intervention <laughs> by Mrs. Hopewell, the magical tree, or Santa Claus himself, yeah, then he's 
they've made a car crash. Yeah, yeah Dolly Parton. Or this is just a happy coincidence. Yeah, Dolly Parton did it in Christmas on the Square. She put a child in a car accident <laughs> to teach someone a lesson. True. <laughs> oh my God, it's Dolly Parton. She's behind all of this. But then again, again, it's completely pointless because it's never yeah. mentioned. Judy returns uh-huh. and it's never mentioned. Uh-huh. So Lily has snuck into the sled to help her brother, Pappy, and they talk some shit. This is daytime now. Uh-huh. This is daytime. Because uh, uh, it was nine o'clock when they left. The sled's been yeah. going. It's now daytime. So I'm assuming the sled, the licorice, has been running all through the night. Yeah. Yeah. Poor licorice. And then, then he discovers Lily. So Lily didn't make a fucking sound. No. At all. <laughs> She's just all there. night. She was just there. Um, a bear appears. <laughs> <laughs> a strange series of events. A bear appears just before they get to the North Pole. But Licorice saves them. Lily slips and is left hanging off a cliff. <laughs> and then gets knocked down by a bear. <laughs> who's been bitten by Licorice. And she slides to the bottom. The bear then falls off another cliff. Seemingly to its death. To his death! Like a really steep... Licorice like kills a, the like bear! Like fall. <laughs> like, he doesn't slide down anything. He just falls. Yeah, Licorice fucking kills licorice the bear. Licorice kills the bear. And as far as we know, Lily's dead as well. Yeah. She's far to her death. Yeah, well, <laughs> she kind of slides more, doesn't she? Whereas the bear is like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Falls off a cliff. Why was the bear included? <laughs> it looked like blue. <laughs> you know, so if this is aimed at kids who are familiar with the Jungle Book... They've just seen Baloo <laughs> be attacked by a dog yes. and falling off a cliff. <laughs> because it look, the animation yeah. is to make it look like Baloo from Jungle Book. Mm-hmm. Um, Happy and Licorice try to find Lily until night time. Mm-hmm. So I'm, this is... I'm confused. So when... I forgot to mention. When Judy left, she says, I'll be back before Christmas. Yeah. Which, it appears to be Christmas Eve. It is Christmas Eve. It's Christmas yeah. Eve. That's, after that, is when Pappy, all night, sled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it must be Christmas Day. Yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. But it's not. No. Is it? No, it's not. Because the whole day hasn't passed. Mm-hmm. Um, they try to find Lily until night time. Yeah? Yeah. Um, but can't find her. So I'm confused. <laughs> Judy returns now to find Lily and Pappy have gone. Um, so Mrs. Mavilda fires her. Yeah. Judy sheds a tear. One single tear. <laughs> one Lisa Rinna tear. The, the, the bunny's been handed back. She sheds one single tear as Pappy and Lily call for her in the distance. <laughs> so I was like, the, the way that the animation looks, it looks like their voices are coming from a fucking star. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Mavilda gets her pal to cut down Mrs. Hopewell, but Judy and the kids stand in his way. They yeah. all link arms. No, no. Okay, let's let's correct that here. Judy grabs the kids and <laughs> puts does, them in does, the way. She's like, come on, kids. Let's stand here. And if they're going to fucking chainsaw the tree down, they'll chainsaw us with it. She puts their lives in danger. Well, they put her kids' lives in danger. It's true. They forced Pappy to go to the North Pole. It's just, it, I mean, that's true, but she she literally tries to force a man to chase all these kids and herself. Yes. And the the most fucked up thing is, he is about to do it. Yeah, he is, <laughs> yeah. But he's stopped when the mayor appears. Uh, Ray returns. <laughs> Everyone fucking arrives. This is, this, is, this is the bit where I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, it's hard to keep up. Well, it, this is the, the the main part. The mayor appears. Ray returns. Happy and Licorice return. <laughs> Mrs. Mavilda hides and the mayor talks to her, even though she's hiding. He says, Mrs. Mavilda, wherever you are, I want you in my office first thing tomorrow. That's Christmas Day, though. Christmas Day, yeah. Puppy but, also... but Puppy told everyone that he wouldn't be in his office Christmas yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah. Puppy also tells uh, Judy that Lily's dead. And Lily's like, oh no, my daughter. That's yes. it. That, not even a single tear. She's more upset about losing I her know, job than yeah. losing the child. Um, Mrs. Mavilda then grabs the chainsaw to chop down Mrs. Hopewell. Uh, well, you've not got a speech about, uh, about the relationship between the children and Mrs. Hopewell. Judy using her degree in child psychology to figure all this out. Well, she just grasses her up, doesn't she? <laughs> 
Yeah, she tells the mayor. No, I haven't got it. Have she you? Te- no, no, but she tells the mayor. She's like, these poor children. <laughs> expectations on me. <laughs> these poor children, they've had to make friends with this tree because of this miserable life that this old cow's given them. Yeah. Which is the speech. But a long-winded speech. Which is the speech you should have given much earlier in the yeah. film. Um, yeah, Mrs. Mavilda grabs the chainsaw to chop down Mrs. Hopewell, but is struck by lightning. <laughs> Um, then Santa appears <laughs> and turns Mrs. Hopewell into a Christmas tree and returns Lily. So he must have found her somewhere. We know we didn't get that scene. We yes. didn't get the scene where he finds no, Lily. He, he yassifies uh, Mrs. Hopewell. Santa magically gives the kids new clothes and sends gifts down chimneys in the town <laughs> with little parachutes. Um, my question is, if Santa is real... Why didn't he give the orphans any gifts before this point? I know, yeah. Because they didn't know who he was. So why why can he magically give them gifts now? Because they believe But now. when they were suffering for years, they always... Well, they, how can they believe in something they would never learn? They were never taught about Santa. He's like a ghost. The more attention you give him, the more he appears. <laughs> like Freddy Krueger. Like Freddy Krueger. Like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Uh, the mayor asks Judy to run the orphanage, but Ray tells her not to, as they will be adopting the orphans. Mrs. Mavilda isn't dead. But she, Somehow. But isn't. But she was thrown to the other side she, of the building. But she was thrown to the other side of the building. <laughs> she looks the same, but doesn't talk. So I'm assuming the lightning's done something. Um, and Judy... <laughs> Removed forg- a voice box. Yeah. And Judy forgives her, like, straight away. Yeah. For no, for no reason. Yeah. Um, and then we get the narration at the end, which I had to get down word for word. So brace yourselves. Well, I guess this town is going to have the best Christmas ever. (laughs) Happy and Lily are back safe. The other children have themselves a mum and a dad. Ray and Judy got themselves the job of running the orphanage for all the children to come. (laughs) The mayor got his town decorated, which I had no idea he wanted. (laughs) And Mrs. Mavilda, well, Mrs. Mavilda, she's going to be all right. From what I heard, she got a job back at the orphanage as Judy's assistant. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's far too much. Was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, don't worry about Mrs. Mavilda. She's good now. She learned that you always win when you are good. Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, okay, that makes no sense whatsoever. Number one, I have no idea that the mayor wanted the town decorated. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. So has the town never been decorated? No. 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 Even though it's got bags of money, Even the town's never been decorated. Yeah. No wonder the kids didn't know about Christmas and Santa and shit. Uh, Mrs. Mavilda, apparently she's all right. Yeah. Okay. Child, you know, abusing children the entire film. Ray told Judy not to take the job at the orphanage. But the narrator's telling us that they both took the job at the orphanage. They mm-hmm. adopted the kids. But, but still kept them in an still orphanage. Kept the orphanage. <laughs> so the kids still lived in the orphanage. So we're going to pretend you, that we're your parents, but we're still going to treat you like orphans. Yeah. So now the kids, the nameless orphans, uh-huh. have to fight for attention more. Yeah. Because now they've been adopted. They could have been adopted individually uh-huh. and raised in homes. Yes. Yeah. Where people use their actual fucking names yep. on a regular basis, <laughs> but it didn't. Absolute fucking nonsense. That was all there for a morality tale about how if you're good, then you're essentially if you're good, you're good. That that's literally it. That's what it's trying to say. You always win when you're good. And that's they it. decide to tell us that. Through an old lady, it's something that I assume is supposed to be relatable for kids and to make them behave for their parents. They decide to tell that through an old lady who has a gambling addict, a drinking problem, and abuses children. Yeah. The the same character who does absolutely fuck all to redeem herself, but is forgiven at the end. Apart from get struck by lightning. Apart from get struck by lightning. It just, and and we're, we're not doing it just, it's hard to do it justice, just how monotone the delivery is apart from mrs mavilda who is so ridiculously over the top including that narration and the narrator like you read out word for word there what he said like he genuinely again it sounds like he's 
it's being written for him as the scene is going on. It's true. When he's like, oh, yes, well, don't worry about her. She She's good now. Yes, she, she's all right. She, she's winning because she's good. And you can hear in his voice, even he does not believe what he's saying. No. Even he's like, what the, why am I fucking saying this? It was it was a it was quite painful to watch. It was it, it oh, was it's, funny but painful. That is the Christmas tree, yeah. That's the Christmas tree. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> who it's made for is anyone's guess. No idea, because I don't know why any kid would want to watch that. I just don't know what it the is... purpose was. What was the purpose? <laughs> it is overwhelmingly depressing. Yeah, like from the first three minutes onwards, and. It's it's weird to say that it's also a lot of fun because of this because I mean technically this is a film about child abuse and orphans being abused, but because of the way it's delivered with animation and these deadpan voice actors and Mr. Mavilla being so over the top and the stupid writing, it's fucking hilarious. Yeah, it's. It's a film of a lot of conveniences, when it's never really explained because it's kind of like, well, if if you're good, you'll always win. Yeah. But there's so many moments of divine intervention that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Like, like, well, but the this is your a lot of this is based on like a Christmas miracle. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So what are you trying to say? What is this? It's yeah, it was fucking awful. It, it really bizarre. was. <laughs> uh, so for the, for this episode, we'll be doing the awards as a whole at the end, giving yes. it out to all three films, so they'll all be battling it out. Um, but for our ratings, I give it one chainsaw wielding gambling addict employed about a DBS check out of ten. <laughs> I gave it one Santa who could have resolved this issue much sooner out of ten. <laughs> and is it a masterpiece, trash to piece, trash or basic? I said trash the piece. It is a trash the piece. Because you can't... It is. You can't make... You, you couldn't make something like this intentionally funny, especially given its subject matter. No, no. It's... Yeah. It, it's not a forced sort of trash the piece. No. Which is the best kind. Yes. <laughs> Next up we have The Christmas Light from 1995. Written and directed by Michael DeVito, who made The Christmas Brigade, a sequel to this. A, a very Womp Key Christmas and hidden treasure of Womp Key Wood. Right, never heard of them. Unknown budget and again, straight to video. This one's 23 minutes long. Thank God. This is 23 minutes long. Um, again, you know, same question. Why the fuck was this made? Who brought this 23-minute piece of shit on VHS yeah. back in 1995? <laughs> Again, the artwork for this says, if you love Toy Story, you'll love this. They are lying to They're you. They're lying. They are telling a big fat lie because this has absolutely no connection with Toy Story <laughs> whatsoever. No. This came out the same year as Toy Story. And Toy Story has aged sublimely. Yeah. You know, it it's a fantastic film, a fantastic story. So it is possible to yeah. do that sort of, and and it still looks great to this yeah. day. It's possible, and I understand budgets. I understand, but if you haven't got the budget to be able to do something like Toy Story, just for, even for twenty three mm -hmm. minutes. Then don't fucking bother me. They tried so hard to copy the animation, the CGI animation, yeah. and it it's embarrassing. It's, it's I, is it given? I'm not even sure if it's given PlayStation One. I think it is. I think that's probably the closest we can get. It's like fucking Tomb Raider. Um, Tomb Raider had way more going on. Yeah, it's all blocks and circles, yeah. and it's it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. I can't believe anyone, even for kids, kids would be terrified of this. I can't believe anyone gave this to go ahead to be released. No. We know someone, no, in this, don't we? So uh, we'll have a brief section. Yes, for, uh, hey, I know you. Kind of. We don't really know him. Or, are you sure you don't want to call AI? No, ho, ho. 
Yeah. Cool. Keeping um, that festive spirit up. <laughs> so the narrator for the Christmas light... Is it Christmas light or Christmas light? The Christmas light. Oh, of course it is. I thought I'd miss about that. Okay. Um, the narrator is Dan Haggerty. Yeah. Who was most famous for playing Grizzly Adams. Yeah. And this is after he was arrested for selling cocaine to an undercover cop. So that explains why he did this film. I feel like he sold it to the director of this film. Um, <laughs> Dan Haggerty, known for Big Stan, Elves, Abducted, Abducted 2, The Reunion, Chips, The Love Boat, Charlie's Angels, Axe Giant, The Wrath of Paul Bunyan, Motocross Kids, Father Frost and more. And as you said, he's also known for selling cocaine to undercover police officers and going to jail for it. He's known for his beard catching on fire in a restaurant, being an animal trainer and stuntman having his own barbecue sauce and being the only person to have his star removed from the Hollywood Walk of Fame because it was actually for Don Haggerty and there was a typo. Yes. What a guy. But then he did get his star later he on. He did, he did. You know that meme? I don't know how, but he did. I don't know. It, you know that meme of the guy in the wilderness with the beard that looks at the camera and gives a smile and yeah. a nod? I think that's Grizzly Is Adams. it him? I okay. think that's him. This guy's, I mean, he's, he's an icon anyway. I mean, what the fuck? Who who has a life like that? That's... Yes. Come on, Dan Haggerty. There you go, Dan Haggerty. Um, and chose to be in this. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose he chose to be in this. Our second feature presentation. The Christmas light is inside you, inside you. Ain't no way, there ain't no way, there ain't no way, no matter what you say. The Christmas light is inside you, inside you, in your heart. Ain't no way, there ain't no way, there ain't no way, no matter what you say the christmas light is inside you i can see it it's in your heart the christmas light is inside me i feel it in my heart so we we watch these on YouTube. Um, you can't get them anywhere else. And it came up with the little notice from the start of the videotape. It was like, recorded in EP mode if you experience picture problems. Adjust tracking control. I'm sure that's not actually the problem here. <laughs> and uh, if it is, it's not very useful for us watching it on YouTube. But no one should have to adjust their tracking. This, this is... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, so we get some very brief opening credits. <laughs> it's just the title, isn't it? Five seconds. And then narrated by Dan Haggerty in front of a fireplace. Is there a Christmas There's tree? There's a Christmas tree. There is a Christmas yeah. tree and a fireplace. Um, which is the same introduction as the Christmas tree. It Christmas is. tree and it a is. fireplace. It is. Now, we've got into a few details about Dan Haggerty. Hmm. Dan Haggerty... Fucking makes the most of this paycheck, doesn't he? Because there's rarely any moment in this film where we don't hear his fucking voice. Yes. So what this is most famous for, really, is the fact that Dan Haggerty tells us everything that's going on on the screen. So it's a narration, but it's it's just talking. Yeah. And just describing constantly what we can see. And it's like I said to it you earlier. It doesn't really give anything... It doesn't really add anything to it because we can see what's going on. Well, it's like I said to you earlier. I mean, obviously, we don't know the target age for this film, but I seem really young. But if a child is too young to understand the visuals, they're not going to fucking understand the narration. No. It's almost like an, an audio description, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I don't, I don't... We all make choices when... Of choice. The narration introduces us to Santa's workshop in the North Pole that looks like a fucking prison. <laughs> With, I think, it's, 
I think it's meant to look like it's the a Wash- state. The Washington Monument. It, it's an absolute state. It's it, it makes no sense. So obviously, what we've come to expect from Santa's Grotto, Santa's Workshop, the North Pole, is yes, snow, but also lights. Yeah, and color, yeah. and big candy canes and shit like that. This literally looks like a prison. Yeah. Like there's a bit <laughs> of snow. Everything's grey. Everything is is like um. The liminal spaces. No, no, you you actually described it best earlier. You said it looks like a fucking rejected level from Goldeneye. It does because that's like, like an unfinished. It is a level. fucking rundown warehouse. Yeah, those working conditions are not healthy. It looks fucking freezing. It it looks horrible. There's only two <laughs> stuff elves. We nightmares. only need two elves. Yeah. Everywhere else is completely empty. So it is. Like these really creepy liminal, yeah. sp- uh, you know, spaces on YouTube. But he always talks about all his other elves. Where the fuck yeah. are they? Where are they? He clearly didn't animate them. Um, <laughs> so, shockingly, Santa is at his desk, like an office desk, and he's looking at a graph. He's got a graph printed out in his hand. Look at this graph. <laughs> yes. And it looks like Santa's stock is plummeting or something. It is. It is. It, toy production is behind and he's very worried. And Thanks, Dan Haggerty. Sh- shaking know. his head. Um, the, the elf Isaac has a genius <laughs> new invention, though, that will create kids' toys in no time. And we get the narrator describe <laughs> the machine working. Chops up the wood and before you know it, there's a toy at the end. Fantastic. Gonna make production so much quicker and so much more efficient. I, 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 I didn't realize this was a business. You know, they're acting as if it's like Donald Trump, <laughs> and he's like, "How we, you know, my stock's plummeting. What are we doing here, like, fellas?" Eric, Isaac's done a fantastic job. He's a genius. Santa's very pleased. Yeah, but they're interrupted by over the tannoy system. <laughs> Santa! <laughs> <laughs> fucking loud, obnoxious voice. Oh my god. It's a uh... delivery. <laughs> and uh, it, it does sound like, I can't remember which one, but do you remember Ed, Ed and Eddie? Yeah, it does. It's, it does sound like. When it's... Santa! <laughs> God, that's Burton Lemon. It is. Dan Haggerty tells us it's Burton Lemon, Isaac's chief competitor. And he wants Santa to report to his office immediately. Yeah, yeah. The neuro- uh, Dan Haggerty tells us that everyone hates Burton Lemon. They fucking despise him. And they call him the Lemon behind his back. Some... <laughs> they all hate him. Some less than others. But they hate him regardless. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently it's okay to talk behind his back. Yeah. There's yeah, no kids problem. is absolutely fine. It's okay. Give him a horrible nickname behind his back. Uh, Burton is... Also, like Gary... the, the nickname's his fucking surname. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, like Gary said, Burton is Isaac's main compet- uh, competitor in toy making, which I didn't realise it was a competition. Um, which, with Santa's graph, makes me question what their true intent is. <laughs> is it to give <laughs> toys to kids? I'm not sure. This is, you know, uh, Santa might get angry when we're not, if we're not around. Um, this narrator is telling us everything (laughs) he's spilling the tea spill that tea grizzly adam he misses out the fact that burton looks like a gigantic twat with his stupid fucking glasses stupid in glass houses excuse me (laughs) i do not look like burton the lemon (laughs) burton (laughs) um burton has invented an even better machine that will make uh, toy making much quicker and it's much better than Isaac's invention. <laughs> he says, we won't need any goofy little elves around here anymore. <laughs> Red to The fill. library is wild and truly open during this scene. And you know what? Not even just for Isaac. He even starts reading Santa to Phil and he, he does. does and he does this to both of their faces. He does. So, he does. in my eyes, I mean, he's kind of the better man here because everyone else is talking about him behind his back. Yeah. So he's it saying to, it to their faces. I'll say it to your face. He keeps it 100. Uh, Burton's machine produces a toy train 
lovely. But it starts to shake and then explodes. <laughs> that it does. Uh, the, the toy train, not the machine. Burton is absolutely fuming that Santa won't use his, in, his uh, invention. And he lets Santa know by <laughs> the medium of song. And he sings a song before falling onto or into something. I mean, it's completely empty space. So I have absolutely no idea what he's fallen onto. And he becomes a snowman who well, will ruin Christmas by creating a blizzard that will probably kill people. Okay. okay. The song that he sings, I'm the one. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Is that the official name? I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea. But it's... Do you have the lyrics down? I have some of the lyrics. All I have is, I'm the one. What? No, he's not even singing it. He is saying it. You are <laughs> doing is. far too much. You are doing, you, you are being far too kind there. Like, it's quick. It's easy. It's even fun. You'll ruin the day that you had your way with me. Okay, what the fuck? Had your way with <laughs> had me. Had your way with me. Oh, Santa, what have you been doing with Burton? Exactly. Um, Sounds like a spurned lover. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yes, that happens. That, that fucking happens. It does happen. That musical number happens um, with no effort whatsoever from the voice I'm actor. the one. Yeah. I'm the one. Yeah. But then, he, he what he falls into is, his, I, I believe it's his own machine, because he explodes. But he comes back out as an ice sculpture. Isaac fucking pokes him and makes him crumble to pieces. Mm. First time in this film that Isaac tries to murder someone. Yes. He's Within gone. 23 minutes. Burn's gone, poor Burn. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, of course, he transforms into an evil possessed uh, snowman and threatens to murder children with a blizzard. Yes, he says, I am no longer Burton Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> the, what confused me is this is a snowman, but he's c quite clearly made of ice. He, he is. It's yeah. like the, the the animation is like glass, you know, it's like ice. Yeah. It's not snow. Santa... Surely a snowman's the easiest fucking thing to do. <laughs> he's just said he's going to murder a bunch of people with a blizzard. Yeah. Santa's and like... a flying snowman. Yeah. Santa's... Snowman. <laughs> snowman. Santa's like... <laughs> I will not let him ruin Christmas. Okay, no, 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 no. He's just threatened to murder a bunch of children. That's mm. not going to ruin Christmas. They'll be dead. Yes. <laughs> Isaac has a plan, though. I swear. <laughs> In a bizarre series of events, uh, we're introduced to Jennifer and Jeffrey. We are. Getting ready for bed. And uh, Jeffrey says, Jennifer, it's snowing so hard. How will Santa get here? Yeah. It's snowing so hard. Yes. Who has ever fucking said that? Ever. It's snowing so hard. And um, I can honestly say throughout this whole film, I the snow doesn't fall very hard. It does not fall very hard. No. No, there's hardly any snow at all. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey needs comforting though. And he Jennifer does. decides to comfort him via the medium of <laughs> And this one, much better than uh, Burton Lemons, I have to say. Oh, I don't know about that. It's just, there's a light, a light of goodness. The Christmas, Christmas light. light. In you and me. But that is it. That It's so off key. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's, it's, the singing's not good, girls. <laughs> Dan Haggerty's like, the blizzard is swelling and getting closer to the children. Excuse me. <laughs> and fucking Jeff, he looks fucking Baked. He yeah. has seen some shit. He has taken some shit. But while she's singing the song to him, he looks like he has been fucking smoking weed for hours. He is fucking out of it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's one way to get him to sleep. I suppose. <laughs> In order to save the day, Isaac and Santa <laughs> travel on Isaac's new invention, which is some sort of plane. It's called Sled 2, isn't it? <laughs> And it's kind of a plane sled spaceship hybrid. Yeah, it's better than Santa's shitty old sleigh. Apparently. The narrator tells us it can fly and see through the toughest storms. <laughs> but it doesn't. It has... As we'll find out. Well, it has a device attached to it called External. And yes. it can see through the snow. Santa's like, uh, okay, I'm only using this piece of shit because I'm desperate and I'll never use it ever again. But like, it doesn't. It, it gets to a point where it can't see through the blizzard. Yeah, like, no, straight away. Yeah, like straight away. 
<laughs> and Santa has absolutely no issue in telling Isaac how shit his new invention is. <laughs> but he's like... Uh, well, I'm always guided by the Christmas light anyways. Then why the fuck are you in sled exactly. too? Exactly. Why aren't you getting Rudolph? <laughs> so he uses the Christmas light to guide his way. And the Christmas light guides him to Jeffrey and Jennifer's house. Yes. Ex-Cam tells him that he's in trouble. Creepily, Santa wakes Jennifer up. He appears in her rooms out of nowhere. Appears out of nowhere. And Jennifer, for some reason, is sleeping on top of her brother. <laughs> She's like, oh, bedtime now, Jeffrey. <laughs> but then when we she's see fucking her, suffocating. she's asleep, but she's like on top of the covers that he's under <laughs> and asleep, like squishing him. It's so weird. Um, What I'm confused by is why nothing's Christmassy in this film. No. <laughs> like nothing, like Santa's grotto. There's no decorations. Not Christmassy. <laughs> Jennifer and Jeffrey's I understand it's the bedroom, but not Christmassy. Like, nothing. There's no. nothing Christmassy whatsoever. No. Um, Santa starts flinging his arms around <laughs> as the narrator tells us that he's telling Jennifer the whole story leading up to that point. He asks Jennifer to join them and tells her she doesn't need to change. <laughs> despite her worry that it will be cold in just her pyjamas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably should think... let her change. Yeah, I should probably also leave whilst she yeah, changes. I don't well. feel like I need to tell you how creepy that comes across. <laughs> Santa clicks his heels together, <laughs> which is infuriating because I'm a friend of Dorothy, and they're now back on sled two. Yeah, they find the snowman very quickly uh -huh. because you know we need to keep this under twenty five minutes. <laughs> And uh, the snowman turns to a giant saw. A bus saw. Bus yeah. saw. And then a torpedo. Yeah. I'm conf what confused me, particularly in this point, is that the blizzard doesn't even look that bad. All we're getting is a grey background with a little bit of snow. Yeah. Surely the moment where we're seeing the snowman is the moment where the blizzard should be at the worst. You'd think And the so. Christmas lights should be guiding them. Yeah. Also, this is giving me stuff. <laughs> Like Andros, do you remember Andros at the yes. end of Star Fox? It's giving me that. Um, Isaac wants to melt the snowman using his little robot and kill Burton. Yeah, he also falls asleep. He also Bottle. does. Yeah, he does seem to fall. <laughs> I think that's the problem with the animation. Uh, but Jennifer persuades Santa not to let him kill Burton, and the snowman turns into a giant fist and punches them. <laughs> yeah. So. Isaac says, just give me the word, Santa, and X will destroy him. And Jen's like, oh no, please don't murder him, it's wrong. And Isaac's like, uh, well, you must murder Burton. I mean, if it was one of the other Alphs, you'd do the exact same to them. <laughs> True. Santa's actually uh, debating whether to murder him or not. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, they, they nearly get killed themselves because of this. Why the fuck is Jennifer here poking her nose in it? What, just why well, is she here? They invited her. Why is Jennifer why? the one? And why is she not questioning any of this? Exactly. Like, he woke her up in the middle of the night. This this strange man in her room. Yeah, she believes in Santa Claus, whatever. I feel like the character meant to be a bit, whole, a bit old, but with this animation, who can tell? But well, she, yeah, clearly she's looking after her brother. Yeah. And the parents like, are out. They have no parents. No. And, <laughs> but she's like not questioning how he's appeared in her room. Why does a fucking killer snowman on the loose? Yeah. Like, well, she had to explain to her. Unless she was taking some of whatever her brother's been taking. My question is, he didn't even show her any ID. No. Like, how does she know this is the real Santa? <laughs> because he fucking appeared randomly in her room. <laughs> well, I'm sure that... He clicked his heels and took her to the fucking yeah, well, spaceship. Well, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, but by that point, she'd already trusted him. She said, oh, I won't get dressed. Um, they crash land in the snow after being punched. And whilst Santa and Isaac try to repair the ship, Jennifer sneaks off and goes to the snowman's cave. Because apparently the snowman has a cave. Yeah, why does she know where it is? How does she know where it is? Also, why does it take ten minutes for Santa and Isaac to realise she's gone? Exactly, because the narrator, Dan Haggerty, tells us that ten minutes later, <laughs> Santa and Isaac finally realise she's gone. <laughs> but she snuck off yeah. into wherever it is, the snowman's cave. She must be fucking freezing because she's still in her pyjamas. Uh, Jennifer attempts to stop the snowman 
by duetting with him. <laughs> and it works. Okay. Yeah. This is fucking bizarre. Um, she starts singing her hit song, The Christmas Light, again. Yeah. Um, and then he's like, no, it's not inside me. She's like, the Christmas light. No, it's not inside me. The Christmas light. And it keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, on. Um, and then it goes on so much that he fucking melts. And then he's like, it's inside me. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it inside me. <laughs> So no, that's just that's just Isaac. He's yeah. just showing up. Um, Santa and Isaac arrive just in time and tell Jen that she tried her best, but it wasn't meant to be. It's, oh my god! Okay, stop wanting people to fucking die, you yeah. fucking weirdos. Well, we get the Burton is dead fake out, don't we? <laughs> and then suddenly he comes back. Yes, he rises from the dead and is like, Jen, thank you for helping me realize I'm a good guy. Oh, Santa and Isaac, I realize you are my friends, Santa. Who was almost murdered by Burton. Mm. He's like, oh, it's all good. We can still save Christmas. Don't worry, Burton. Everyone makes mistakes. He tried to murder you and he various other children you. as he well. He tried to kill numerous people. <laughs> um, uh, then we end with Burton <laughs> joyfully exclaiming that we're the Christmas Brigade. Yes, the a team to bring Christmas magic to every day of the year. Yes, which is the name of the sequel to this. It is. Which so, we will never watch. Setting up the Christmas light cinematic universe. Yes. The narrator tells us to keep that Christmas light shining inside of all of us for every day of the year. And says to have a happy and peaceful Christmas. Thank you, Dad Haggerty. And there we have another 90s morality tale. Yeah, I, I, with with some extremes in there. That's the Christmas light. That's the Christmas light. That is one film I don't think you can do justice on a Christmas. Light. No, I think it's it's something that needs to be seen to be believed. It, it's the fact that it's not tied in with anything as well. It's just no. it's just out there. It just exists it's, for is... no reason. With the weirdest fucking plot. Uh, you know, if this was a 1950s, 1960s B-movie, hello, Santa Claus Conks the Martians, um, I don't think it would be as weird. It'd be hilarious. It'd still be a trash to piece, by all means. But it's the fact that they tried to make it like Toy Story, but then gave it the plot of a 1950s B-movie. It... Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those films where stuff just happens. Yeah. Because it happens. And it's like, oh, okay. Might be my favourite one, the three. Yes, it is my favourite. Because, number one, it's the shortest. Yeah. And, number two, it's probably the campest. Yeah, yeah. It's It's got songs, catchier songs than uh, the, the other film that we're <laughs> about to discuss. And, um, yeah, it's, it's fucking stupid. Yeah. It's really stupid. I give it one baked brother out of ten. One baked brother. I give it one trip to the doctor because there's a Christmas light inside me <laughs> out of ten. And it is, of course, a trash to piece. Uh, yes, yeah, it's definitely a trash to piece. I, of, of all of these, spoiler alert, but this is the one where I would say you should watch. Like, you should watch. It, yeah, it also has the worst animation out of the three. It, it has, yeah. It has, and it's actually, I mean, probably the closest to horror in the horror. It culture. is. It is. <laughs> it is. There because is a there's... possessed snowman. Oh, it possessed snowman, but also like the animation and the empty. Yeah. Just the emptiness of everything <laughs> is so creepy. It is. It is. <laughs> uh... And that brings us to our third and final presentation, which is. The nuttiest nutcracker from 1999. Yeah. Oh, um, I forgot to say, sorry, the Christmas light has a 1.7 on oh, IMDb. okay. So slightly higher than the Christmas tree. I don't know how this final film has a higher rating than both of those yeah, put together. With a 4.2 on IMDb. I can tell you now, if Y2K did happen, then at least it would have been put out of our misery of watching this fucking film. Um, yeah, because... This is just fucking 
I, I don't know. I, I have no words. No. Because out of all of them, this is the most difficult to describe because it, this does just happen. Yeah, these... The, the one thing that all three have in common, apart from what I listed at the beginning, is they all just kind of happen. Yeah. It's just kind of like, here you go. Yeah. Look. Bit like, of trivia for like this one. Like a turd in your front room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a bit of trivia for this one. To capitalise with both Toy Story, mm -hmm. which is uh, in then vaulted by Disney back in 1997, and Toy Story 2, which was in within the initial theatrical release, this film was debuted on CBS Primetime on December 3rd, 1999. Primetime. So, unlike The Christmas Light, the Toy Story ripoff is so... So obvious in this one. Um, specifically Toy Story 2. Yes. Also, have you ever seen... And I've, I've never actually watched one, but I've seen quite a few around. The Veggie Tales. No. Now, the Veggie Tales, I believe, were fairly popular. There seems to be a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But I think they're biblical stories. Okay. With vegetables. Yeah. With, like... You know, broccoli and and shit like that. So this seems quite similar to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also is oddly similar to Sausage Party. Yeah. Wow. Well. So I feel like this may have been an influence. A little precursor to Sausage Party. Directed by Diane Paloma Eskenazi, uh, who seemingly made loads of low budget ripoffs of Disney films that were being released. So she did The Jungle King, Snow White. Oh. The Night Before Christmas, Noah's Ark, Pocahontas, The Princess Castle, Tom Fum meets Fumbelina, wow. Tarzan of the Apes, etc, etc. There we are. Uh, Co-directed by Harold Harris, who made Bob and Margaret, Clone High, Ever After High, Legacy Day, A Tale of Two Tales, that is one title, Dino Paws, Just In Time, as in just in the name, time. Right. Uh, and many more. Yes, that's right. This film was directed by two people. Mm. Written by Diana, uh, Diane Paloma Eskenazi, and co-written by Cindy McKay, who wrote Bratz Desert Jewels, Bratz Pampered Pets, Clifford the Big Red Dog, Beverly Hills Teens, Muppet Babies, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, wow. Timon and Pumba. Yo Yogi, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, like various episodes of those, um, and plenty more. Again, that is confirmation. This film is written by two people, one who has wrote a lot of episodes for established shows. Yes. Budget, we actually have a budget for this one, wow. $84,000. Nice. It cost them to make this. Okay. And it was straight to video. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, prime t you said Primetime CBS. It was also on Primetime CBS as well, but yeah. then it was released on video. Okay. So, let's talk about who's in this one. Hey, I know y'all. Thank you. Debbie Derryberry plays Mary. Right. Marie, should I say, Marie. the protagonist. Uh, also plays Fritz and also plays Marie's little brother. That is Fritz. Okay, thank you. Aladdin. <laughs> she, she was in Aladdin. Uh, Which Toy one? Story. Which one? The, the Aladdin. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. Toy Story and Toy Story 2 playing the aliens. Okay. Babe. She played the pups in Babe. Ah. Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Wow. Minions, Despicable oh. Me 2. Right. And more. But that's that's a career. That's, you there know, she's voice. big names. But yeah, there is some big names in this. Yeah. Cam Clark as the Prince. Uh, Asparagus and the Mouse Sergeant. Yeah, was in Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. I'm desperate to watch that film. Big... That might have to be a podcast episode next year. It might year. have to be. Big Hero 6. Oh. Clifford's Really Big Movie. Wow. Hotel Transylvania. <gasps> and many more, including Akira. Yes. Um, I had him done as the voice of Leonardo in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah. animated series. Yeah. And he's done subsequent voices for Leonardo afterwards as yeah. well. And the moment I found that out, mm -hmm. I could hear it in his yeah. voice. I was like, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Jim Belushi's in this. 
Jim Belushi is in this. As Reginald the Mouse King, uh, Jim Belushi, of course, if, if you're not aware, being the star of Red Heat, K9, Little Shop of Horrors, ER, Jingle All the Way, Trading Places, Twin Peaks The Return, Last Action Hero, and more. Jumping Jack Flash. Yeah. Yeah. Cheech Martin is Jim in this. Jim Belushi's kind of one, I feel like he's known. Yeah. Or at least his face is. But he isn't... I feel like he's one that's probably more famous in America than the UK. I think so. Much like Cheech Mar- uh, Martin. Marin. 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 Cheech Marin. Cheech Marin. Um, who plays Mac the... Mac, Mac the Macadamia Nut. Yeah. Uh, Cheech Marin was in born in East LA. Tin Cup. Up in Smoke. From Dust Till Dawn. Christmas of the Cranks. Jane the Virgin, The Lion King, Planet Terror, Coco, Spy Kids, After Hours, and more. Yeah. Lots more. So he was most famous for the Cheech and Chong yeah. movies. Um, very much based around the fact that he smoked a lot of weed. Yeah. I mean, that was it. You know, it was that kind of late 60s counterculture and him and his friend bit like Harold and Kumar. Yeah. You know, just Stoner Bro movie. The original Stoner Bro movies, yeah. really. Um, I remember him from The Golden Palace. Oh. The sequel series to The Golden Girls. There we go. Where he played the chef in the hotel that The Golden Girls owned. <laughs> and finally, we have Phyllis Diller as the Sugar Plum Fairy narrator. Um, Phyllis Diller being the star of A Bug's Life, Eight on the Run, Mad Monster Party, The Fruits of Southampton, Motocross Kids. I believe it's the second time we've had that in this episode. No. Peria, Babylon, uh, The Perfect Man, The Silence of the Hams, and more. Right. Yeah. Phyllis Diller, I, I, another one I don't think made her way over to the UK. No. I don't. But she, I think she was most famous for her hair. She was a comedian, kind of Joan Rivers mm-hmm. style comedian, and she always had very wacky hair. I always used to see her on the, you know, I think it was the Dean Martin roasts. Yeah, I used to watch them a lot when she appeared on them. The question is, these are these are well-known names. How well-known on names? Earth. I mean, this film's eighty thousand dollar budget, so eighty-four thousand dollars. That it's not even like it would have been a massive payday either. Why the fuck did they do this? It's probably a massive payday. When you think in terms of each of them probably got all their lines done in one day. Well, I suppose, yeah. You know, Phyllis Diller, I mean, she she hasn't got the most lines. No. You know, Jim Belushi, he's got a, a few lines in a song. Yeah. You know, it's quite... When you think the film doesn't... It, it doesn't even make mm-hmm. an hour. So they all were probably done in a day. You know? Yeah. Should try and get through our third feature presentation. What's happening? If we don't get that star back on the tree by midnight, then Christmas will be gone forever. We can't not have Christmas. We're finished. We're cooked. Chuck slice dice. <gasps> Where do we go from here? Full fire! Columbia TriStar Home Video presents. A classic tale. Sergeant, attack! Gone nutty. Looks like we got a rodent problem. Retreat! <laughs> Victory! Alive! He's a fiend, I tell you. Your four basic food groups. And it's a lovely day for a war, folks. The cabbage heads are up in arms and the zucchini just got squashed. Run! Never, I say! Star in an adventure. On the count of three. Three! Of epic portions. <laughs> It's food with attitude. All right, baby. Featuring the voices of Jim Belushi, Cheech Marin, and Phyllis Diller. <laughs> the nuttiest nutcracker. That's with uh, Phyllis Diller. Yes. Uh, the narrator, the narrator, Sugar Plum Fairy, and she says, "What a night, Christmas Eve! Don't you just love it? I know I do." 
And then it comes up the title, The Nutcracker. And it's like, yeah, yeah, probably figured it. It's just the same old, same old. But this one's got a nutty little twist. And then it <laughs> says, The Nuttiest Nutcracker. Yes. So on a snowy Christmas Eve, Marie and her brother Fritz are oh. home alone. Well, they're not home alone, are they? No, they're not home alone. With their uncle, Drosselmeyer. <laughs> Marie and Fritz's parents are away for the night, and Marie is dismayed at having to spend Christmas Eve without them. She then wishes for Christmas to go away forever. She's fucking fuming. She's like, oh, I had to spend Christmas alone. No, you don't. You're there with your uncle and your brother, you twat. Why are you giving her Phyllis Diller's voice? Because <laughs> <laughs> she kind of reminded me of another character in another shitty animated Christmas film coming up on the podcast this month. Uh, who has that voice also? Hey, old yes, Santa Claus. that's the one. Um, yeah, my question for this scene, and it was actually answered, but I'll ask it anyway. Why is the Christmas tree still got the ladder leaning on it? <laughs> <laughs> like, why? <laughs> why is the Christmas tree like from the get go? Um, so I feel like I just need to give a little backstory to this. So obviously, this is based on the Nutcracker. Yeah. The story, the um, 19th century Prussian short story, The Nutcracker, mm -hmm. which was famously made into a ballet, really famous, and this is a nutty twist on it. Um, so, confusingly, Marie, Fritz, and Uncle Drossel Drosselmeyer are dressed in kind of upper class mm -hmm. 19th century Prussian yeah. gear, mm -hmm. you know, like the original story. Their accents could not be more American it's if true. they tried. <laughs> um, very confusing. Because you think, I would, I would rather at least have them tried a bad German accent. Mm -hmm. I would have at least have... I would have yeah. preferred them trying that. It may have been a little more, uh -huh. bring a little more camp to the film. Yeah. Made it a little funnier. Also, do you know how old Marie is supposed to be? I have no idea. Because she acts like she's a fucking child. She acts like she's a child, but yet yeah, multiple characters want to get married to her in this film. Yes. It's alarming. And the animation looks like one of those fucking straight to video Barbie films from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Yes. I believe one of them was Barbie and the Nutcracker. I mean, they, they could have easily passed this off as it. Yeah, they could have, actually. Yeah. Isn't, aren't those Barbie films, are they not actually quite well received? I, I have no idea. Of course, I didn't watch them when I was younger. Mm. I was, I was uh, far too masculine for that. In the closet. <laughs> so, a group of anthropomorphic nerds. Colonel. <laughs> Who's like an old army sergeant nut. Mac, who is a Jamaican stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, to be honest, and voiced by Cheech Marin, who I believe was, um, who is a Hispanic. Yeah. So, yeah. Sparkle. Sparkle being dressed like one of the dream girls. Yes. With... Almost a Lisa Renner haircut. Yeah, Almost. Just like Lisa Renner Eminem. Lisa Renner Eminem. <laughs> so close to Lisa Renner Eminem. She, her accent, I have no idea what she's going for. It's sometimes French, sometimes American. Um, Stash. Can't remember Stash. And Gramps, who's an old wrinkly <laughs> nut. They overhear Marie's plight but become relieved at the scene of Uncle Drosselmeyer giving his niece and nephew Christmas gifts, a cannon for Fritz and a Nutcracker doll for Marie. Um, She's very pleased with the Nutcracker doll. She is. But I'm a, I'm a bit like, um, why? Like, he gets a cannon and she yeah. gets, what, a Nutcracker? Uh-huh. And she didn't even crack a nut. No. She doesn't. She's just like, I love my Nutcracker. I'm like, you haven't used it for its purpose. Crack some nuts, bitch. Honestly, this scene is... Fucking obnoxious and absolutely chaotic. This entire film is just absolute chaos. And with the nuts, shit. when the nuts are introduced as well, it's like, yeah. oh my god, it's so much. 
The Nets believe that the doll may be their prince and proceed to tell Little P, <laughs> who's a little peanut, the youngest of the Nets, the story of how the Nutcracker Prince's relationship with a princess cursed by a mouse queen had turned him into a wooden figure, revealing that only true love will break the spell. So, yeah, Little P, this... And it, it, I don't, I didn't want to get them all down because it, it infuriated me. But there's so many nut puns at the beginning, isn't there? Yeah. And it's just, it's, constant. it's just constant and it's a barrage and it continues for the rest of the film because if it's not, it, it was, it's not nut based, it's food based puns or it's mouse based puns or it's yeah. cheese puns. And it's like... We get the fucking joke. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just pun after pun after pun. And I understand the film isn't for us. But I think even at 11 years old, we'd be like, mate, this is too much. Yeah. I love a pun. I love a dad joke. But not a constant barrage of them for fucking 45 minutes. <laughs> Jesus Christ, let it rest. Do we think Uncle, whatever his name is, knows that the, uh, that the Nutcracker... Is, is a real person hidden inside a doll. And do you think he's trying to pimp the Nutcracker out to Marie? Maybe. Yeah. He's uncle. The uncle is a weird one. He is. Um, apparently the prince had to break the hardest nut in the kingdom to save the princess. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious dialogue. Um, Fritz takes the Nutcracker from Marie. A chase up the ladder of the Christmas tree ensues hence why they left it there, resulting in the doll falling hard to the floor. Upset by how hurt her nutcracker is, Marie turns Fritz away. Shut the fuck up. Um, that's one sturdy fucking ladder. It is. Or is it the tree that's sturdy? Because they both get on the ladder, which is leaning on the tree, mm -hmm. and the tree don't move. No. So I'm not sure how real that tree is. Uh, Fritz and Marie, like I said earlier, are very American accents. It's really confusing. I'm confusion. Um, she forgives her brother later in private. And question: Do we see the brother again? I don't think so. I don't think we do. Um, uh, she tells her Nutcracker that of all the gifts, she loves him <laughs> the most, which is very convenient. After kissing the doll on the lips <laughs> for some reason. Marie becomes tired and falls asleep. She fucking gets drugged. The nuts fall asleep as well, unaware of being targeted by the Mouse Queen's son. Oh my god, the story's yeah. true. Um, he's called Reginald. Yeah. And he plans to steal the Christmas star on top of the tree and take over the Christmas kingdom. With his army of mice, he attempts to capture the nuts. Um, he informs of this, of this plan... <laughs> By the medium of song. Well, before that, he says, just look at that deluxe assortment of nuts. <laughs> and uh, what was your favourite part of the song? Was it the um, big cheese, big cheese, that's me? Where he starts talking about all the pussy you can get because <laughs> he's a great rat. Or he'll, I'll wear the gold-plated underwear. That's the one. That's the bit. I'm the future Christmas king. I'm Reginald the big cheese. Yeah. <laughs> mice like cheese. So we had a whole song dedicated to mice liking cheese. Yes. Um, the I'm the one song from the previous film could have been a Grammy nated song. Yeah. Uh, this in, isn't in comparison this, it's to this. Not, this isn't good. Uh, the mice army fight toy soldiers wherever the fuck they came from. Um, but they, pro they prove to be no match against the mice. Max stages a coup de tête with his own army of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> the foods are eventually exhausted by fighting, and poor Gramps is captured by three mice. I don't. Where does Gramps go? Do we see him later on? No. I don't know. It's hard to keep track. Uh, this is. Uh, we watched these in uh, with. These three films, this episode, this was the last one we watched. And I have to say, I was fucking exhausted by the, the end. 
Um, highlights of this battle include asparagus needing butter, stat, and farting beans. Yes. Because that's the level of humour we're at. Which is fine. It's a kid's yeah. film. But, you know, give us something else for the rest of the fucking film. Gramps also asks one of the mice, are you a man or a mouse? And the mouse obviously replies, I'm a mouse. Oh, okay. Marie, awakened by the bell, sees her doll alive and fighting Reginald. Marie intervenes. Reginald is infatuated with her, but she brushes the mouse off her foot using the Christmas star. However, as the foods celebrate their victory, Marie is magically reduced to the Nutcracker Prince's height by Uncle Drosselmeyer. Never explain why he does this. No, no. Again, this kind of pushes the narrative that I said about him uh, pimping out the Nutcracker for Marie. Some of my favourite dialogue from this scene. Leave my Nutcracker alone. <laughs> um, as she goes to get away from the mouse, she goes up the ladder and then says, go away and let me come down. I said, well, why'd you go up the ladder in the first place? <laughs> And as Uncle Drosselmeyer is reducing his niece to a nutcracker size, he says it's time for a little Christmas spirit. Right. Okay. She could have been killed in this whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the foods inform Marie that without the Christmas star, Christmas will be gone forever, which is what she wished for not too long ago. So I don't know why she's changed her mind. That's never explained either. Fortunately, Marie still has the star. They head into the Sugar Plum Fairy's kingdom to seek help in getting the star back on the tree. Uh, Sparkle says, You are marvellous. You go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> they all argue over who's going to go first. To where, I'm not sure. I don't, but I don't, was it a pear? I don't know what fruit it was. It makes no, no sense. I've, it looked like a pear, but that makes no sense because he keeps saying women in citrus first mm -hmm. because the Titanic movie was yeah. two years previous. Um, Max sings a gospel song. Yes, he does. About keeping the Christmas faith. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't feel like I need to tell you why Cheech Marin... Um, playing a Jamaican stereotype singing a gospel song is not okay. So I won't. Just as the entourage reaches the fairy's castle, Reginald shows up and captures Marie. Imprisoned in the cheese foundry <laughs> of Reginald's palace, Marie laments her failure to save Christmas and imagines herself slow dancing with the prince in a chapel to emotional music. Yes. Let's make one thing really fucking clear. This is one of the worst songs I've ever heard. <laughs> and yet it's the best song in the film. Um, well, yeah, technically, I suppose, It yeah. starts with, uh, Don't cry, lady. You can be so happy. Well, she can't. And she probably can cry, actually. You probably, didn't tell him, you probably shouldn't be telling him not to cry. She's just been fucking kidnapped. Yeah. He, at one point, says, God's love shall rain down. <laughs> and I just wrote the word awful, awful, awful. He just takes her to a church as well. It's like he's trying to force religion on her. Yeah. Um, it, I feel like he was desperately trying to sound like something from the Lion King mm -hmm. soundtrack. It was giving me that, but also crossed with every male lead Disney ballad. Yeah. It's given that his voice, I'm not sure if it's the, the voice guy singing it. I'm not sure if Cheech Marin was singing, I don't think he's mm. famous for his singing, so I'm assuming he wasn't singing the gospel song. No. Um, But yeah, I, 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 this was really bad. Also kind of camp because it was so bad. It's difficult. <laughs> Um, she is then summoned by Reginald, who offers to marry her. She refuses, but eventually sympathises with the Mouse King after learning that no one has given him a single Christmas gift. No. Why is she sympathising with him? No yeah, one. He no literally wonder no kidnapped one's given her. It. Yeah. He has tried to. He's continuously tried to force her to marry him. Which, again, considering we don't know her age, there's so much wrong with that. 
Well, we don't know the mouse's age either. What's yeah, Reginald's but he's old age? enough to legally get married. What, in, in the Cheese Kingdom? Yeah. Uh, the prince and the foods arrive at Reginald's palace, adamant on rescuing Marie and the others captured by Reginald's army. The foods are reluctant at first, but agree to sneak into the palace after noticing the prince's courage. Um, yeah, this... I don't... Again, I feel like it's trying to be an amalgamation of so many other films. Uh -huh. Because it's kind of trying to give um, Wizard of Oz. It is. Like, the, the Sugar Plum Fairy Kingdom, it, it's Oz. You yeah. know, and it's Follow the uh -huh. Elaborate Road. Uh, and then the, the Reginald has, like, flying mice. Or yeah. Has flying monkeys. Uh, Reginald and his sergeant perform a dance number. <laughs> a very camp dance number. Very. Trying to impress Marie, but I, I don't think she really gives a shit. No. Um, the, I mean, the prince and the, the fruit and veg and nuts, they just get into the palace. Yeah, they don't have to try much. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. So the prince is reunited with Marie. Chaos ensues when Reginald overhears a black eyed pea. I'm not sure who Will I Am or Fergie. Fergie. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at him for not winning Marie's heart. A chase on flying motorcycles made of crackers and olives follows suit. In the middle of the chase, Reginald's palace starts to collapse. Oh no. After the foods are rescued, Reginald... You notice that we haven't really got much to say about any yeah. of this. It's I just... can tell you right now, that sounds way more exciting than it actually exactly. is. I can't remember a exactly. single thing about that. After the foods are rescued, Reginald falls into the Cheese River due to his vehicle running out of fuel. Marie, having grown soft... <laughs> <laughs> the erection has gone. Marie, having grown soft for the king, saves him and loses the star in the process. Reginald admits that it was the first nice thing that anyone has ever done to him. Who gives a shit? He fucking kidnapped someone. Before producing the star to Marie. The... Do you want to hear a secret? Not a secret. I don't know. A secret. I'll tell everyone. I'll tell everyone. This is what I... I'm scared the new Mario film's going to be Death. like... <laughs> Instead of Reginald, it's Bowser and yeah. Marie is Princess Peach. I'm scared that this is what we're going to get. Uh, the group arrives at the Sugar Plum Fairy's castle where she reveals that the Christmas star <laughs> is able to grant any wish, including the power to bring Marie's parents home. Um, well, they're not dead. Uh, aren't they going to be questioning that when they randomly appear back home? Yeah, um... but what I don't understand is I want my parents home. They're out having a nice time, yeah. you fucking selfish bitch. <laughs> God, they're having a few fucking sherries on Christmas Eve. Leave them the fuck alone. Get to bed and they'll be there in the morning. Of all the, the, this Christmas star grants any wish. Yeah. One wish grants any wish. This selfish bitch uses that one wish. I wish my parents were home earlier. Right, fuck you. Fuck off, Marie. After making her wish, Marie gently tosses the star to the ceiling <laughs> and the screen fades to white. What what does the Sugar Plum Fairy say? Wow, well, what are you waiting for? Just visualise it at the top and give it a toss. Give it a toss. <laughs> and every, all the fruit and veg or whatever, whatever the fuck they are, the fucking greengrocer <laughs> says, thank you, Marie. I was like, didn't she fucking cause all this? <laughs> Surely it's all her yeah. fault. Marie wakes up to find her parents greeting her, because she's a selfish bitch, <laughs> along with Uncle Drosselmeyer and a guest resembling the prince. He says, uh, I knew I would... I, would oh, I, don't, I don't even fucking care what he says. <laughs> the film ends, thankfully, with Marie and the prince sharing a kiss, while Mac and the nuts provide the mistletoe. I don't fucking care. It was shit. That was fucking awful. I really... I felt drained by the end. I don't know why this has the highest rating. <coughs> I think... Do you know what my problem is? And I'll go straight to, you know, ratings and shit. You know, spoiler alert. My problem is, it's fucking basic. It it's is. it's it fucking is. basic. There's no camp. There's no fun. It's the same joke over and over again. Again, things just happen. 
for no reason. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it just bleh. there you go. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It's fucking boring. I uh -huh. was bored. It was tedious. The songs were shit. Yeah, really. I just thought it was really, really bad. There was mm -hmm. no fun. It wasn't fun. It wasn't entertaining. Yes, I know I wasn't the target audience, but I was in 1999. I was the yeah. target audience. I was 11 years old. And I can tell you now, if I'd watched that in 1999, I wouldn't be saying, oh, I really enjoyed that. I'd be mm -hmm. saying the same thing. Basic. There's nothing boring. to it. There's nothing to nothing it. Nothing to at it. All. There's nothing. The same shitty joke over and, and over again. And yet again, another fucking morality tale. That's where someone does something really shitty and they're forgiven in the name of Christmas. It's true, So yeah. there you have it, listeners. If you ever wanted to commit a crime or, you know, do something really bad, now's the time of year because all is forgiven because of the Christmas star. Yes. I give that piece of shit one toss out of ten. I give that piece of shit one more fucking cheese, nut or vegetable pun and I'm switching this shit <laughs> off out of ten. Um, yeah, um, between basic and trash for me. It is. It's fucking basic. It's trash. It's basic. It, it It's a difficult one because we've just given three films the same rating. Yeah. Yet, this is by far the worst one. It is. Because yeah. the other two, there's some entertainment value. Uh -huh. I did not find this entertaining. No. So, let's get to the awards. And again, we're handing it out uh, as a whole. As a whole. All three films, not per film. So, for me, the biggest queen of this episode in these three films is Mrs. Hopewell. <laughs> the titular <laughs> character think, yeah. from the Christmas tree. Especially when she's yassified at the end. Exactly. And turned into a Christmas tree. Can we also stop gendering Come on, trees? Come glow up. Thank you. Um, I'd, I put Judy, I suppose. Why? She fucking forgave a child abuser at the end. <laughs> she did. Yeah, but I didn't have many choices. Jennifer? I mean, she sang a song to save the day. Yeah, she also told them not to murder. And she also sleeps on top her. of her brother, which was That's weird. weird. <laughs> yeah, Miss Mrs. Hopewell. That's a good choice. <laughs> I've changed mine. Um, biggest gasp I have: Mrs. Mavilda being forgiven for child abuse in the Christmas tree. I put Mrs. Mavilda ripping the clothes off the orphans. <laughs> that, yeah, that was that was, that was a big what? gasp. The yeah. Fuck? Best dialogue, actually. The, uh, it has to go to just visualize it at the top and give it a toss. The sugar plum fairy narrator and his nutcracker. Okay. Um, not my choice. It has to, my choice. It has to go. Santa. <laughs> final... I want that as my alarm in the morning. <laughs> Santa. And finally, that's camp. It has to go to Burton Lemon absolutely reading Santa and Isaac to filth in the Christmas night. Oh, line. that's so true. Burton Lemon is a queer icon. Uh, I put Mrs. M Mrs. Mavilda's purple lipstick. <laughs> it's true. She gets struck it's by true. lightning and it's still not out of place. No. Not, not even close to a smear. That purple lipstick's absolutely slayed. If you wanted to check out any of these, they're all available on YouTube. And if you enjoyed any of these, I'm sure I can speak for both of us when I say we recommend checking out... Psychological Rock... evaluation. Yes. I mean, first of all, what the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Second, if you did enjoy it somehow, uh, then check out Rap City Street Kids Believe in Santa Claus, a film that we will be discussing as a bonus episode on the 23rd of December. Yes. I plead to anyone listening to watch Rap City Street Kids before listening to the podcast episode. Yeah. Just as soon as possible. It's on YouTube. It has to be seen to be believed. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I, I, I recommend anyone watch it. It's it's impeccable entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know your favourite shitty Christmas animated films on social media with Horror Culture Shiver on Facebook and Instagram. Horror Court Trash on Twitter. I'm done at Gaz92 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and GazCruise92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Sparker823 on Letterboxd and Instagram. Don't forget to check out our very own festival as well, Gasp Horror Fest across social media. Give us a rate and everyone subscribe on iTunes if you're feeling in the festive spirit and want to, you know, give a little Christmas gift. Rate, review, and subscribe on that, and like, follow on FNLs. Give a rate on Spotify. 
Next week, we are bringing you more Christmas trash with the... I, no, I haven't got a word for it. But we are discussing a karate Christmas miracle. Yeah. That is a film we have a lot to say about. Yes. that's It's a one-of-a-kind experience yeah. for the festive season. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say for now. <laughs> yes. So we'll be back same time, same place next week. Bye. Bye.